question. So, as I was saying, this is just one way to capture yesterday's discussions. Lots and lots of words. Um, for some of you know, this is just a simple word mapping where the, the bigger words are the ones that... Uh, a little bit louder, yeah? Uh, so this is just a one way to capture the discussion. It's a word map. So all the bigger words are the words that uh, were used most often. Not surprisingly, so we have ecosystem services, finance, um, biodiversity. Is this, good? Uh, is this okay now? Can you hear me? Yeah, everyone can hear me. Thank you, thanks so much. So this is just one way. And apologies that uh, this is in English. Um, but as they say, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So uh, in addition to just me standing up here talking and uh, sharing this slide, we've also put together a short montage of photos which were taken here yesterday and the day before. And as I share a few of my own uh, reflections, they'll be playing in the background. Um, and I think they'll do a far better job of capturing highlights or at least uh, giving you a chance to reflect on some things from yesterday. So no worries if you pay more attention to the screen than you do to my words. And you might see just a few surprise photos thrown into the mix. So here we go. So um, yesterday in the afternoon I spoke with many of you informally and I, I think it's fair to say that overall we had an amazing day um, despite the absence of just a few colleagues uh, yesterday morning. And we um, definitely benefited from a, a, share, a combination of formal and informal conversations that allowed everyone to give voice in the room and it was quite an amazing display of expertise that we had. Uh, we started the day with an inspiring set of welcoming remarks, opening remarks, and a keynote speech, uh, followed by a great plenary on public finance. And then we had a series of technical uh, sessions that I'm sure you remember well on results-based budgeting, implementation, uh, donor funds, impact investment, policy and institutional review, green lending facilities, and accessing climate finance, bio, bio prospecting. So we had these great discussions, very rich. Um, and I think um, just the way these photos, maybe, especially this one, <laughs> these photos, uh, they, they really, we really came together as a team to share our experiences. And this is a, exactly what we need to do going forward to safeguard biodiversity and achieve the SDGs. Um, now, I'm not going to uh, do any more summary of the technical discussions. There's not enough time, and, and uh, that's not the point of this. Um, but I would like to just re-quote some of the amazing, inspirational things that a few people said yesterday, with, with their permission, who, which I have not asked yet. <laughs> um, biodiversity finance is about securing the future of humanity. It's our insurance for a safer and more prosperous world. It's about public and private investments and nature-based solutions for sustainable development that leaves no one behind. We recognize nature's beauty and power and intrinsic value. And we recognize the importance of investing in nature, which has been our strongest but often most silent ally. Biofin is a global movement, a massive shift in our collective mindsets. Species belonging to the animal kingdom usually don't act to their disadvantage. However, humans are an exception. It's time we stop acting to our disadvantage. The negative effects of environmental degradation are most acutely felt by the poorest and permeates into the lives of all sectors and classes of society. We must maintain our natural assets so they can continue to provide ecosystem services to the women and men whose lives and livelihoods directly depend on them. The SDGs offer an incredible opportunity and framework and investing in biodiversity is key to our vectors to achieve the SDGs. Eradicating poverty, ensuring durable economic growth, and environmental conversation, this is one and the same fight. We are the first generation that can eradicate poverty, and we are the last generation that can save the planet. Each of us should be the change we want to see in the world. Our task, our common task, is not only to preserve biodiversity for future generations, we need to pass on to them a more sustainable set of development pathways. This is one blue planet. It's all that we've got. There is no planet B, and the time to act is now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Great pictures to remember yesterday, and thank you for pulling out all those wonderful quotes and interesting things that people shared with us. So we're going into our second day, which will prove to be equally exciting, I'm sure. And I just wanted to remind you very briefly what's on our schedule today. 
Our opening session has two kind of shorter panels, and we'll get to that in a moment. After our panels, we have then two of the parallel plenary sessions where, again, you'll choose one of the four groups to go to. That will be before and after lunch. And then starting at 4 o'clock, we have our marketplace. And so that will be featured in the marketplace area. And at the end of this morning session, we'll tell you more about that. Very quickly, I haven't received very many of the open space hosting cards. And so remember on your tables, you have the small cards that invite you to host a conversation, just an informal conversation, um, tomorrow. We've got a session of those. So if you're thinking about that, take the opportunity. People are interested in talking and sharing, exploring, brainstorming, everything that you'd like to do. All you have to do is host a conversation. So fill in one of these forms and make sure I get that today. Let me go now to our panel. And I wanted to say a few words about how we're going to do the interaction. Each panel is going to be short, just 40 minutes each. That's going to include a couple of questions if you have them. But we're not going to stop and say who has questions and take hands. We're going to do the questions a little bit differently. Also on your table, you have a pack of papers. Every table has a pack. During the panel, if you have a question, we want you to write it on the paper. So you need to write it legibly because we have to be able to read it. If you write something we can't read, we're not going to use your question. So. But as soon as you have a question, write it down and then hold it up. There are three volunteers in the room. I'm going to remind you who you are. I had Tim, Max, and Andy, wherever you are. They're going to be, and I, watching the room. As soon as you have a question, write it down and hold it up, and somebody will come and take it from you. We're going to collect the questions during the panel, and then just maybe there are some we can combine, etc. Then we'll hand the moderator the questions, and the moderator will ask the questions to the panel with as much time as available for questions, okay? So we won't open the floor, so don't wait for that because then we'll miss your question. Write it down legibly and hold it up and one of us will come and pick up the question from you, okay? So that's how it's gonna work with both of the panels. All right, without further ado, we have our first panel waiting for us. And I'd like to introduce the moderator, Andrew Mitchell, who's the founder of the Global Canopy Program. So, Andrew, over to you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't know if you know Global Canopy Program, but it's uh, an NGO, uh, which I founded about 18 years ago uh, in Oxford. And we spend a lot of time looking at forests and finance. So we're going to be looking at finance and biodiversity on this panel. But I wanted to ask you, a question, uh, just to get things started. Anybody here watch the Oscars uh, recently, on Sunday night? I don't know if any of you did, the American Oscars, the Academy Awards. And I wondered if you knew who got Best Actor. Anybody know? His name was Gary Oldman. And he got Best Actor for playing Sir Winston Churchill. And Sir Winston Churchill was our Prime Minister during the Second World War. And I don't know if you know the name of the film, but it was called Our Darkest Hour. And I sometimes wonder, in the fight for biodiversity, whether this is our darkest hour. Now, the reason why it was a darkest hour was it was a kind of a turning point in the war, when uh, Britain was right up against it uh, and didn't look like there was much hope in sight. Uh, and I wonder whether we're at a turning point now for biodiversity. Certainly, I think we might be for uh, finance and biodiversity. You know, working in this business is very tough. I've been in conservation for 40 years. I started out climbing on climbing ropes up into the canopies of giant rainforest trees as a zoologist many, many years ago and have worked in many national parks. And it's pretty depressing because so many of the places where I used to work have gone up in smoke and uh, have been changed beyond recognition. You know, Churchill had a definition of success. Churchill's definition of success was to go from failure to failure with increasing enthusiasm. That's what we all have to do in this room. Uh, it's tough fighting 
for nature. But I do get a sense that things are changing, certainly in the world of finance. I, I used to start out hugging orangutans, and I realized I couldn't save them that way. So I joke sometimes that now I hug Bloomberg terminals. If you don't know what a Bloomberg terminal is, it's a computer through which the largest financial institutions in the world make their decisions, and it's full of data. And what's wrong with a Bloomberg terminal is there's no data on natural capital. There's very little data on natural capital. So you can destroy nature and it doesn't appear on your balance sheet, either in a company or in a finance institution. And that's something we have to change. We have to get nature inside natural capital, inside all the Bloomberg terminals of the world, not just Bloomberg, but many others because we need to understand the value of nature in financial transactions. And what I see happening in the last couple of years is a huge change in banks, pension funds that move trillions of dollars around the world to waking up to their responsibilities for nature. And that is going to change the world because it's all about money. And our panel is about money. So uh, we've seen new kinds of financial instruments appear, green bonds and so on. Just recently, in the last few years, I've been working with BNP Paribas, uh, Big Bank, Rabobank and others, designing large-scale billion-dollar green bonds for landscapes, which will help to transform agriculture to do three things. Yes, produce sustainable commodities, give a good life to local communities, but also support the natural landscape around them. That's what we need to do. So. Uh, we're going to talk about some of these issues now on this panel, so I'm going to walk over and uh, introduce the panelists. We're going to do it new style and in a conversation and explore some of the challenges they face uh, in their own countries. Thank you. How about this one? Can you hear me at all? No? This one? Okay, this one's working now. Good. So I'm going to introduce uh, our team, uh, and we're going to have a, a conversation. So first next door to me is uh, Rakesh Shejwal, who is Vice President of Responsible Banking at Yes Bank. That's the fourth largest commercial bank in India. Yes Bank has grown rapidly over the last 15 years and has launched the first green bond in India and sponsors the Natural Capital Awards. Next to him is Mr. Tumku Davaku, who is Chief Support Officer at Agric Bank, a medium-sized bank in Mongolia, but with big ambitions, especially in the sustainable finance space. Tumu also serves as the Chairman of the Steering Committee for the Mongolian Sustainable Finance Initiative. And Mr. Francisco Gamboa, is executive director of the Chamber of Commerce of Industry uh, for the Chamber of Industry of Costa Rica, uh, and that has been working with business and especially industry in a country that's famed for its conservation principles. So, Rakesh, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, yours is a giant country. Here we are in India. I'm coming to you first because out of respect, because we're in your country, a billion people to feed. Why should biodiversity finance be a priority for a bank? So, uh, as you rightly said, biodiversity uh, uh, hasn't been a priority for the banking sector or the financial sector, primarily because of the lack of understanding uh, and how uh, finance can impact the society uh, when, it, when we talk about financing biodiversity. So, so if so let me just give you a background of how uh, things are working in India right now. When it comes to biodiversity conservation, it is uh, thought of as the government's job. Every uh, forest department is under state government, and uh, it's or even even if a private entity wants to uh, look at financing something, they're looking at uh, conservation in the terms of uh, philanthropy or through the CSR funds. So that's primarily the role of the private sector through CSR or through philanthropy. Nobody has yet thought about uh, getting returns from it or developing a sustainable finance model for biodiversity conservation. So that's where the gap lies. So, and uh, this is where 
an op it's an opportunity which is right now unexplored and it is important to uh, know it, it is important to see that a, if a bank or if a financial institution looks at it from this perspective it it's going to impact the society as well it's not just that uh, that the bank is going to benefit or the forest and the biodiversity is going to benefit, it's going to benefit the people as well. So, well, you've really been a pioneer on, these, uh, on uh, natural capital in India. Um, tell me about some of the things that you feel most proud of that, you've been, that Yes Bank has been able to achieve. So, Yes Bank uh, has looked at biodiversity in the terms of natural capital. So, we, we signed the natural capital declaration back in 2013. And since then, we have looked at it from a risk. Can you tell us this a bit? What is that declaration, the natural capital declaration? So the declaration is a CEO-led initiative where we commit to uh, integrating natural capital considerations into our portfolio, right from a risks and opportunities point of view. And this, uh, this level of understanding has helped us identify uh, natural capital risk for one, our own operations, and for our portfolio as well. Uh, and for the portfolio, uh, for our own operations, we've done ISO 14001 uh, uh, and environment management system, which has helped us reduce uh, year over year about 5 to 10 percent of our environmental footprint. So our own operations are safeguarded, one, uh, we've saved on a lot of money, costs. Uh, and when it comes to our portfolio, right now we are in the process of uh, piloting the AERM, the, which is a project uh, by the NCFA. Uh, it's the advancing environment risk management uh, project, which will uh, which will help us look at natural capital risk holistically. It's uh, it's going to help us uh, identify on our portfolio what, like for example, how will a drought impact a drought in a particular geography impact my portfolio. So that level of understanding is really going to help us uh, safeguard our portfolio. I just just want to I just want to explain that because you can imagine the vastness of the financial sector, banks lending to lots of people, and they don't have an easy methodology for knowing their impact on nature, and that is the tool that's been created uh, through the Natural Capital Finance Alliance, which is called. Uh, Advanced Environmental Risk Management, AERM. So if you Google NCFA Finance, you can find out information about this. And this is being tested by Yes Bank and other banks. It's going to be tested in Peru and Colombia and South Africa. And this, for the first time, will look at all aspects of nature, how businesses are connected to it, and how it affects the finance industry so they can see what their impacts and dependencies are. And it's going to be an exciting thing. And you're, you're going to be testing this inside the bank. Can you tell us how you might go about doing that? So first, we'll probably do a pilot. We'll probably pick one sector and look at uh, one geography, probably a st one state of, uh, of the country, because uh, we have portfolio everywhere in every state. And to test it all out might, might get tricky. So we're just going to pilot it on uh, one geography, one sector, see what the results are, and then slowly start applying to uh, the rest of the portfolio. So, uh, Tumbu, I'm just going to come to you now, if I may. Um, you're working in a, a completely different scenario. Mongolia, a country of just 3 million people, not 1 billion. Yet I think you told me yesterday you have 23 million heads of livestock. 66. 66! heads of livestock, only three million people. And of course, these animals are eating up biodiversity on the steppes. You've got great problems of air pollution in the cities from burning coal because your country, it's nice and warm here, but imagine it, it's minus 30 in Mongolia when you came just over here. So they need a lot of coal to keep warm. Tell me a little bit about your bank and how you're approaching some of these natural capital and biodiversity issues. You need uh, a microphone. Uh, you've got, a, got one on your belt. They Good. gave me this clip on. Uh, yeah, so we're a fairly large country of uh, one and a half million square kilometers of land for only three million people. And fairly extreme um, summers and winters, minus 40 winters with plus 40 summers. And uh, Mongolia has been disproportionately affected by climate change. 80% uh, of our land is under some level of desertification. Uh, the temperature increase in Mongolia, the average, 
is three times the global average. So from the natural and man-made impacts, we do have the duty of going into sustainable finance. And uh, we came together, the, uh, when I say we, uh, we mean the commercial banks in Mongolia, 14 of them, came together a few, few years ago and uh, came to a conclusion that through finance, we can steer the development of the country in the right direction. Uh, so, as uh, part of this, we established the Mongolian Sustainable Finance Initiative. It's a, a voluntary private sector-led uh, movement. And now we've uh, brought together the central bank, the government, and also international organizations. And we're in the process of establishing a Mongolian Green Finance Corporation where we will pull together uh, resources and funding from various sources, including international domestic, public private sector, and we will channel these funds in the most needed uh, parts of the country and, and the works that need uh, the urgent attention. Uh, so as for our bank, we see this as uh, an opportunity as well, uh, in addition to realizing that it's a duty of all organizations, especially, especially uh, financial institutions. And we try to get involved in very early stage dialogue with partners, with uh, conservation NGOs, with our Ministry of uh, Environment and Tourism and Ministry of Finance to be part of the solution. Uh, because uh, I think Laura took a very good example of falling in love yesterday and that uh, two people or two sides need to come halfway, finance and environment or nature. So we absolutely agree with that. And as a smaller bank, we see that as a competitive advantage as well to come halfway to this large untapped marketplace of by a diversity finance. And uh, we're doing quite promising progress as of now. And we organize various innovation challenges. For example, now we're conducting an innovation challenge uh, to fight air pollution, to replace the coal burning stoves with more energy efficient and environmentally friendly heating solutions. Yeah, and also we. Uh, closely work with, uh, uh, well, we co-founded uh, an NGO that does work uh, in a protected area uh, to improve livelihoods of indigenous people and also uh, create businesses for them. And through these services of sustainable tourism and forestry management to provide uh, also funding for, for the conservation efforts. So maybe I should leave it at this for now. Well, I, I wanted to ask, because you see, in your country, a large proportion of, of the people are nomadic, and they're moving around all the time, and they are connected very closely to the biodiversity of your country. I'm just wondering, how do you engage them? You know, when you're a bank, I mean, do they need banks? Do they use banks? Do you have a way of engaging with the, um, the nomadic communities, or are you mainly having to focus on the people who've become settled? Yes, uh, they do very much need uh, uh, banks and some uh, nudges in the right direction, uh, in addition to heavily depending on the environment. 40% of Mongolians are still leading very active nomadic lifestyles. Um, and the desertification over grazing is really pushing them into a corner. And uh, to replace, uh, for example, they're growing and raising more goats because of highly valued cashmere they grow. And goats are very, very hazardous to uh, grazelands because they pull uh, grass with its roots and it stops growth. Uh, so they're working to replace goat population with more yaks and sheep, for example. But for this, they need the initial small 
loans mm. and credits to enable them to go into this and to leave their uh, used way of style of mm. the modern day. Uh, and also, they very much need uh, access to marketplaces mm. because they can produce a lot of uh, traditional goods, dairy products, uh, animal-driven uh, mm. derived products, but mm. uh, the connection to the marketplace yeah, I, I just I want to draw out this point because I think it's an important one and one that we don't always think about in the in the biodiversity finance community. <clears throat> so here's a perfect example: markets, probably mainly in Europe, that like cashmere, the very fine warm wool. It's made into sweaters that we wear on cold days. The cashmere is coming from goats in Mongolia. The market for cashmere has grown rapidly, so the farmers put out more goats. They had a tradition, you told me, that they would never go more than 30% goats yeah. in their herds. But now it's gone up, what, to 50% perhaps in some cases? 50 and more. Or even more. So the old tradition has been forgotten because of the market price for cashmere way away in another continent. Where finance can help is that the owners of the companies who are buying the cashmere can put pressure on the companies to say, are you sure that your cashmere is coming from a sustainable source in Mongolia? And then banks can help in Mongolia to provide the finance to support families to become sustainable. This is a whole chain. It's no good just looking at it in the country of origin. You have to go away all along the supply chain. And I, I'm going to pick this up when I get back and find out who owns these cashmere companies that are buying this cashmere to consider how the supply chain can be made more sustainable so that you don't get too many goats eating too much of the biodiversity. So, Francisco, may I come to you now? Um, I always come to Costa Rica last because I always think Costa Rica has one of the best uh, collection of policies. You know, years ago, your country went right down to nearly 25% uh, only of forest. And they built it back up to about 52% now through a fantastic effort, very high conservation policies. Now, you're working in the uh, Chamber of Industrial Commerce. How does that chamber, tell me about some of the things you feel proud of that you've been able to achieve through your chamber. Good morning, uh, Mr. Mitchell and colleagues and, and all people. Uh, as you know, Costa Rica is known by its biodiversity. Talking or thinking about Costa Rica is not possible without thinking about biodiversity because our national brand is uh, based uh, in, in that concept. And because our country is known uh, for biodiversity, you know, we have the 5% of the biodiversity of the world in, in a, and our participation in the total Earth surface is about one, uh, uh, um, 0 0.3 percent of, of our total size of the world. Uh, but we have other activities th uh, than uh, biodiversity tourism. We have uh, some, acti some economic activities like agriculture, you know, uh, pineapple, bananas, and we have also industry, local industry, national industry, but also a foreign direct investment industry uh, in the medical devices sector, uh, and also we, we have services. And our challenge is that all those activities that aren't tourism, uh, they, 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 they must make a contribution uh, to the uh, biodiversity conservation. Uh, recently, we, we did with Biofin, with, in coordination with Bio, Biofin, we, we made an effort uh, to obtain relevant information from the private sector regarding spending and, spend, and investment in environmental uh, matters. And the main objective of the, of the investigation was to research and assess the expenditure and investment in environmental protection uh, carried out by companies in the Costa Rican manufacturing sector. Uh, the, the research was very interesting 
And we, we addressed four indicators. Uh, the, the first one was presence of environmental certifications in our companies, in the, in the manufacturing companies. The second was the existence of a specialized unit or personal responsible for environmental management. Uh, the third one, training in environmental issues for employees. And the fourth one was the uh, level of expenditure and, is, and investment in environmental protection. Uh, they, that, that research gave us uh, very interesting results and will guide the, the national policies about, about uh, financing of biodiversity initiatives in, in, in the country. Now, when, when you're looking for money for biodiversity initiatives, you often hear businesses say it's too risky, or financial institutions might say it's too risky. Uh, can you give us any examples of how the Costa Rican government is helping to reduce risks for businesses or for finance in Costa Rica by possibly providing tax benefits or subsidies to encourage biodiversity finance? Do you have any examples of that? The, the, the main the, or the most important example in, the, in this, this area is uh, we developed uh, something we call a payment program for environmental services, mm. uh, PSA for its initial, initials in Spanish, the uh, Pago por Servicios Ambientales. Uh, it was launched in 1997, uh, 97, uh, 20 years ago, and was decided to contribute to global efforts to reduce emissions and to participate in a global carbon market. Uh, for that reason, or that, that is the, the, the main reason uh, of, of one thing you said in, the, in your introduction, that Costa Rica, for Costa Rica, forests have a value that goes beyond wood. Um, and, and the existence of that, of that kind of subs subsidy uh, reduced the risk of deforestation. All Costa, Rican, Costa Ricans, uh, the, 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 the way of financing that, that tool is that all Costa Ricans earn the, the PSA by means of a 3.5% tax on fuels, another pioneering uh, uh, measure that has been the country. And it, it was also financed with the water utilization fee, um, with all, also with contribution of voluntary payments made by physical and legal uh, personalities. The Costa Rican, also the Costa Rican law uh, of forest recon recognize four environmental services provided by forests, biodiversity, water, scenic beauty, and carbon, uh, carbon retention. Uh, and since the inception of this program in 1997, the PSA has protected or reforested more than 700 uh, or seven uh, seven thousand twenty eight hectares which is equivalent to more or less 14 15 16 percent of our national territory yes well, a very interesting set of policies there that uh, many other countries could think about now Rakesh I want to come back to you because when talking about biodiversity finance, we, we have a question of scale. We're dealing with the whole world here. Biodiversity is in a kind of a car crash with it going down everywhere. I mean, just in Germany, in Europe, where I come from, 75% of the flying insect biomass has disappeared in the last 30 years. When you drive a car in Germany, you don't get windscreen mess on your windscreen anymore because there just aren't any insects. This is. Now, scale is important. Now, if you're trying to deal with this, it might take 200 billion, we think, to help to reduce deforestation and convert supply chains, uh, restore, reform agriculture that causes some destruction. Um, I wanted to talk to you about zero budget natural farming. 
Uh, this is a new proposal by the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, and I know Yes Bank has been having some discussions about a large-scale project here uh, with farmers that will help reduce impacts on biodiversity and give a better life to the farmers. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, uh, so imagine a farming uh, process which will have zero cost. So you don't have to imagine anymore this is going to happen soon or probably is in progress because uh, what, how it works is they don't use any uh, external input, so to say any, no chemicals, no pesticides, nothing. Uh, all of it is uh, natural. So what uh, they do use is like, for example, they'll, they'll coat the seeds with some, uh, some uh, natural uh, paste which will help make them, uh, you know, they'll, which will protect the seeds. Then they'll, uh, for example, multiply the good microbes. So you use substances that multiply the good microbes. All of this is done naturally, like probably a mixture of cow dung and some uh, leaves, et cetera, you know? And uh, what happens is you don't use just one crop. You use, uh, there's a main crop and there are intercrops. So the intercrops uh, will subsidize the cost of uh, putting the main crops. So eventually, it will be as good as a zero budget. And it will be natural farming. It will be completely organic. And that's what the government of Andhra Pradesh is really pushing for all farmers to follow. And uh, Yes Bank is involved in raising the funds required initially. Because it's initially, you will require money. Eventually, <coughs> the farmers will benefit uh, when they, when they uh, start selling their produce. So Yes Bank is looking to raise the first set of capital required for this. And the scale of this, how many farmers are, is the Chief Minister thinking of? Uh, the, farmer, the, the first phase, I think, is about 15 to 20,000 farmers, mm. and eventually it will scale up. Uh, the first uh, tranche uh, requirement is about uh, $600 million. Uh, that is going to be raised uh, in the next three to four months. Mm. So uh, this is just, it's going to go up to scale, and I know they've been talking about if you did the whole thing, it'd be almost $2.5 billion, and that's why you need big financial institutions to come in and put in all the safeguards that are necessary for biodiversity. So that's interesting. Now, we've all been um, listening to Biofin, so I can come, this is a question that some, any of you could answer, but listening as financial, well, uh, from your own institutions, how do you think Biofin can help you in your own countries uh, on biodiversity finance. Are there any lessons you're learning and how, how can it help you? Francisco. Yeah, we, we have identified a lot of barriers from small and medium enterprises perspective and also from the bank's perspective and also of suppliers' uh, perspectives. We know there are barriers. For example, in the, in the case of the barriers from the a small and medium enterprises perspective. We have the, the financial and human resources restriction, the lacking knowledge regarding low emission technologies and variety of choices in the market, the low transparency regarding low emission technologies, also due to the early development stage of the market, extremely long waiting time to obtain a credit while time resources are limited, like lack of guarantees, and we are working with a a financial institution, a program with, with the help and support of Biofin, a, a program uh, that is, is on, this, on this topic. Um, but we have dog barriers, but definitely the message, uh, the central message we, we give to our private sector is that be sustainable and uh, support the biodiversity preservation is a uh, is, is, is an obligation to survive in the market, in the national market, and also in the international market. Mm -hmm. It's a tool of competitiveness and, and a tool of, of survivance uh, in, 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 in the markets nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, Tumu, I, I wanted to ask you, you know, I think because it was interesting, one of the examples you gave me about how you get the public interested in these sustainability issues and you had a good example, and I, I thought it was unusual for a bank to do this, about putting something in the square where you could encourage people to care about, in this case, it was about litter, but it's really about understanding impacts on nature as well. Can you just tell us about that example and how it worked? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, as a development country, Mongolia has its own share of 
litter problems and plastic bags and uh, disposable goods. Uh, and we looked at different ways and through some discussions with innovative people, we came up with the idea of organizing a flash mob every month. So this is organized uh, every last Saturday of every month. And what happens is that our staff now joined by hundreds of uh, other people who support this activity. We gather in a very public place and we place a piece of garbage on the ground and we place a, a, a litter bin nearby and we place hidden cameras and everyone who is participating hides uh, or they uh, uh, blend in the crowd and we record people walking by, kicking the litter elsewhere, and especially the person who actually picks it up and places it in the garbage bin. So we're trying to create role models and awareness as well, so that, <clears throat> number one, uh, if you walk by a piece of garbage, you might be, be, you might be taped, and you might be you know, broadcast uh, through TV and social media, and also, you get celebrated. So when that person, we call them a champion, when that champion picks it up, everyone comes out clapping and you know, applauding the person. We uh, congratulate them with a little souvenir, which is a t-shirt of the, of the uh, activity of the campaign. We invite them to join, join our next campaigns. And now we started well, using celebrities to uh, create more awareness in the society. Well, it's a really good example of a, a bank getting involved with using social media uh, to, to get over a message about sustainability. And I think we could apply some of that in our thinking uh, about biodiversity as well. And uh, we're out of time, but just give me uh, one little idea of hope that you have over the next five years, real fast, like a tweet, just tweet length, just a few words. What do you, what do you see happening over the next five years? Francisco? In the next five months, yeah. I don't know. Just what is your hope? The, the message, uh, the, the, the message we, we, uh, we, we uh, say always to the, the in, in manufacturer sector in Costa Rica is or uh, invest in bio, environmental protection and bio, biodiversity, or you won't survive uh, yeah. in, in the markets. And Tumu, do you have a message to the audience? Well, uh, maybe it's something I uh, personally believe. Uh, there's always a solution. Uh, things seem impossible. Things look researched and really thought through, and there's nothing else is possible until someone discovers a new solution. And it seems so simple. So I think it's the same thing with sustainable finance and turning the mentality of financial institutions. I think there's a solution, and I think it's just about to be yeah. cracked. And Rakesh, last one. Yeah, week. I have more of a warning than a message. Uh, so financial institutions exist for the betterment of society, and it would actually be foolish to think that it can be achieved without taking into consideration biodiversity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there are three messages of hope there. The finance industry is vast, and it has come to the table very late on this issue, but they are waking up, is the message I would give you, around the world. And we all have a duty to engage banks, investors. Think about if you happen to have a pension, for instance. Do you know whether that pension is destroying nature or not? Today, they don't really know whether they are or are not. And uh, you should ask them that question and put pressure on them. And that's how we'll get the finance sector to change and do more for biodiversity than against it. Thank you very much indeed. speakers. There we go. Um, excellent. So 
again, the same system for questions. If you have a question, write it down and please wave it uh, in the air. We'll come up and pick it up. We'll give it to our moderator and uh, they'll try to integrate that in. These are short panels and so, and they're very interesting. So we don't have a lot of time for the questions part, but we'll do our best. Our next panel up, um, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Uh, he'll be getting his panelists up in just a moment. We have with us David Myers, Biofin Senior Technical Advisor and an Impact Investing Specialist. So, can I give the floor to you, David? The microphone, there we are. Thank you so much. Um, I ask my panelists to come up and get or organized here. We have a uh, uh, relatively short amount of time. And first up is, uh, is Frank Hawkins. Frank is the director of uh, IUCN USA and uh, part of the steering committee of the Coalition of Private Investment in, for Conservation, CIPIC. And uh, Frank's worked uh, as a conservation biologist and policy advisor, worked for many years in Madagascar, where we've actually known each other for quite some time. He's a bird expert, on top of being a finance expert now. Um, so thank you. And, uh, and Laura Oritz Montemayor, Laura is a a uh, impact investment expert and a specialist. If, if one of you do, wouldn't mind putting on the, the, the wire. Um, Laura, for those of you who uh, were here yesterday for, uh, for the panel, um, is a uh, founder of SVS X Mexico. She's uh, been working in this space for a long time. She's passionate about regenerative culture and systems thinking, and we're gonna hear some really great uh, words of wisdom from Laura. She's, she's taught impact investing um, and other aspects of business to a wide range of, uh, of interested parties. Um, I could go on, but I'm going to be brief. And finally, we have uh, Eric Baruka, who's um, a consultant, or otherwise known as professor, who's been working in the conservation field um, for around, for over 50 years, and um, is uh, published many books, and uh, um, w currently is a uh, uh, leading the BVIEER, which is uh, part of uh, Bariti Vid... I'm getting this terrible. I'll do it. Okay, you're going to introduce um, a university here in India and has uh, worked with many uh, corporates here in India. So, um, welcome everyone. And uh, what we're going to do is try to generate a bit of a conversation. And uh, so, feel free to ask each other questions. And again, from the audience, if you have questions, ideas that come up during the course of the discussion, uh, please write them down on a piece of paper, raise your hand, someone will come and, um, and pick those questions up and we'll, we'll be able to ask a few of the panelists later on. So um, let's see, let's start, um, let's start with Frank. Um, Frank, you uh, have helped launch this organization called CIPIC, which is all focused on private investment and conservation and um, is gaining some great momentum um, we, we all worry that governments are at their sort of limit in terms of how much more they can spend on, on nature. That's the story that everyone's saying. Um, and so we think the private sector is going to come in and rescue us by investing all this money, these trillions of dollars that they're investing in assets. How is CIPIC going to make that happen? Well, that's a, an extremely good question and one I think that uh, has puzzled or baffled a lot of people who work in the conservation arena because um, I think the sense of uh, engagement and trust with the private sector is at best equivocal. There's often a, an uneasy relationship between the private sector and the conservation world because they see what's happened in the past. Part of our uh, habitual economic process is that the private sector goes around and converts natural capital into cash, which then goes to somebody else. And that's not a very good precedent to, to set, such that you can then uh, um, have confidence that the private sector will actually do the right thing and help you to achieve your conservation goals. So the big, enormous challenge we have is that our uh, natural systems are collapsing. And um, without those natural systems, we don't have a future on the planet. Um, so if we want to look at this from an extremely high-level perspective, the only way in which humanity is going to survive is if we can make nature the center of our economy. That's the only way. However, currently, nature is not an investable asset. If you look at it from a, a finance perspective, um, that means that the only way you can generate value out of nature is by selling it as, and converting it to cash. 
that's an extremely bad way to go about managing your support network. So how is it you can convert what is out there in terms of nature into an investable asset such that you can make very large amounts of money out of cons conservation? That's really the, the recipe for survival for humanity in the world. Now, um, that is such a big challenge that I don't claim that uh, an initiative like CPIC is going to find the, the sole and primary uh, response to that problem. However, you've got to start somewhere. So the way that uh, the Coalition for Private Investment for Conservation is going to uh, have its impact, we're mobilizing support for this already, um, is by identifying what we know that already works. There are ways in which you can invest in nature that do generate a return on investment. Now, these are often initiatives that are tangential at best sometimes to the business of conservation. But very often, conservation projects do generate the kinds of cash flow opportunities that you can convert into something that the finance sector might be excited by. So if you take those initial uh, seeds of success and try and make them into something much bigger, that's a way of creating a pathway whereby the global economy can actually get properly involved with conserving nature. And the way we're doing this in CPIC is to try and find those things that work. We've got five sectors that, are, uh, that have clear examples of where private finance is generating conservation impact. And those five sectors are uh, sustainable agriculture, green infrastructure for water, forest landscape restoration and conservation, coastal zone resilience, and coastal zone fisheries. All, they, all those cases have um, places where private finance is generating a return from increasing, if you like, the stock of nat nat natural capital of biodiversity. Um, they are small. They're only a few million dollars. However, there is essentially almost limit limitless amounts of cash that could be put to those investments if you can find the appropriate scale of investment to attract the investor. And this is where my uh, experience with the finance sector has been really interesting. Um, in fact, it's not. It's actually been very boring. And the, 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 the mantra that you hear from uh, investors is they really want boring products. They want something about which they don't, have, don't want to have to think. They just say, OK, decent return, relatively low risk. Give me $200 million of that. We haven't quite got to that point yet. We haven't got to boring. And what we need to do is to get to boring. How do we get to boring? We find a way to take these, these, these opportunities standardize them. This is what we do through the blueprinting process. We have a, 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 a blueprint guidebook on our website, the cpicfinance.com website, which takes you from the point of having a good investment idea to having something that is more or less investable with links to places where you can find expertise, knowledge about how those things can happen, business planning, that kind of thing. Um, and then once you have a blueprint that is uh, a good idea, you then replicate it as widely as you can across that sector. That then gives you the opportunity to aggregate those projects into something that is of appropriate size to invest, to interest an institutional investor. Um, and in such a way that you can build a portfolio that, uh, where all the risk components are managed through other components of the credit stack. So for instance, through credit guarantees or first loss finance or a technical advisory facility, whatever it is you need to build around that investment such that uh, the risk profile for the investor is uh, manageable. It's something that, into which they can put money uh, as part of their larger portfolio. And then what you need to do is to spread that as widely as possible. Get everybody to start doing this. We've got maybe a few thousand uh, entrepreneurs around the world who are doing this kind of stuff. We need millions of entrepreneurs around the world, in every country in the world, to start doing this if we're going to stand any chance at all of generating the kind of investment we need to make the, have it, the, the planet habitable in 50 years' time. Excellent. Well, it sounds uh, like there's all this money out there. All we need to do is figure out how to spend it, package them up into neat little big packages, and sell them to the finance sector, and we're all set. Although I, I think that it may be... More challenging, as you mentioned, mostly, you know, the problem with nature is it's much, it does much better when you leave it alone, and what business wants to do is cut it down and convert it to things to sell. And so there's a lot of um, uh, structural changes maybe that need to be done before we're able to, to, to package environmental assets as they sit in nature. But, um, but this is what everyone's working on and trying to figure it out. Um, 
one possible source of finance and engagement with nature is, is, the, is, is corporations. And we've heard about the finance sector earlier in the panel. But um, Eric, from, from, from your uh, experience with, with companies, um, what might interest them in terms of getting them to invest in nature? And have they come up with uh, products and, and, and services that they could then sell to the financial sector to, to get uh, more investment? Um, thank you, David, uh, uh, and thanks for that long introduction, but you forgot to say that professionally I'm a surgeon. Um, this is a very interesting question. In fact, there are two types of... Try, try the microphone. I think it may be better than that. Is that better? Yeah. There are two types of corporates in India which have got involved with nature. Uh, some of them have actually been doing this traditionally for a long, long time. They are large business houses who have been interested in wildlife, conservation, forests, and so on. Uh, I, I refer to them as uh, that they have a sort of institutional genetic makeup to do, actually do this. Uh, so you have organizations like Tata's and Godrej's who have supported conservation in India for hundreds of years. So they've looked at these big NGOs, Bombay Natural History Society being 120 years old, WWF, that they have supported these people for conservation traditionally. So this has already been there. The newer ones that come in are coming in because of CSR, because now they're expected to spend 2 to 3% of their revenue back into, uh, into, into sort of uh, some activity which they do. Now, most of them select doing this for healthcare, which is why I get involved often, and they get involved for uh, doing education. What we've tried to do at my institute is shift that educational focus from these industries into education for environment, conservation, biodiversity, awareness, and so on. And I think that works. So uh, there's a growing uh, number of corporates who are getting increasingly involved in doing this kind of work if they are adequately triggered. And, and Laura, so um, we have um, the, all this money that's sitting on the sidelines. We have nature that needs more investment. We're developing um, products that, with CIPIC and, and, and corporates are thinking about, you know, putting money. How can impact investing um, create enough movement to, or, or give us some examples of how this can work on a very detailed level where, where You've got an investable product, you've got a project, you've got money coming in. Um, how can we create this change? How can we build the, the, the level of products to, to satisfy the needs of the finance sector, for example? Thank you for your question. So I guess I'm going to challenge your idea of the boring investments. I'm going to go for fun investments, the ones that you know, challenge all the status quo. Because impact investment didn't come here for boring. Um, impact investment came here as a revolution of the finance paradigms. If finance as usual was delivering any good for humanity, we would keep it that way. But if we actually need impact investment, it's because we need a change in finance. And it's not a superficial change that we need, it's a radical one. Um, so I, I was checking the wall over there and I see only two countries written down for impact investment. My mission right now is that at the end, hopefully, most countries will sign in, in impact investment. Um, so a very concrete example with a very fun structure. Um, basically, what we say is that the financial sector used to be you know, the servant of the economy, and the economy used to be the servant of humanity. But right now, you see finance being the master of the master. So basically, the servant's servant has become the master's master. How did that happen? And if you see the, the business as usual way of doing you know, the industrial sector, um, you see there's a lot of things that have to change. So if you see finance, um, the way we have accumulated wealth, it's so, many, so few people and so many have nothing. Um, basically, we need to... Uh, revitalize the impact investment structures. So I'm here to talk about alternative structures. This is the most exciting, I guess, 
the, the part of impact investment that is the most fun and that we have a lot of fun with. Um, basically, there's several impact investment movements that are playing around precisely with structures. Instead of supporting the vertical structures, the ones that are accumulative by design, we support the horizontal structures, the ones that are distributed by design. So I want to use one specific sample. It's called self-liquidating equity. And this name is super sexy to the investors. You say self-liquidating equity and everyone goes wild. So basically the, the horizontal structure behind this, you have, imagine a group of smallholder farmers. I really like the example of Yes Bank. Yes Bank saying, um, you know, this permaculture idea with smallholder farmers. We don't have that many smallholder farmers in the structures yet. You know, the sizes and the velocity in India are quite massive. Um, I'm talking about 700 in, in Mexico, but that's a lot for us. Um, so basically, uh, this structure, what it does, it, it distributes the shares of the exporting company to the smallholder farmers. So basically, you have an exporting company of all their crops with a very high margin because now they sell with um, a package, you know, and, and they export to Canada and Russia and so many others with a collective brand. So all of these tiny, fragmented, smallholder farmers are now under a collective brand, but they are owners. And this is the, the revolution here, is they are no longer in debt, they are no longer in subsidy, they become owners. And the empowerment and the transformation for them becomes imminent. Like, you, you can notice it, you can see it, and, and they become very proud of being owners. And basically, this way, the finance people they don't have to look for a third party investor to buy them out at the end of the investment. This actually liquidates the whole structure into having 100% of the shares owned by the farmers at the end of 10 years. So this structure has been in, in experiment in Mexico for three years now. We're on the third year and it's the third year that we've been getting double digit returns for both the investors and the farmers. So that's a very specific example of revolutionizing the financial structures. Great. Um, yeah, Frank, so I'm going to pass it over to you. The, the, so the, there's so much innovation that needs to go on at the, at the local level. We need to change our relationship with nature, change how business relates to nature. But the paradox, of course, is that the big money does want risk return. They want, they want, they want boring, as you're saying, and it's true. So how, how do we... How do we get this innovation feeding into the pipeline? Um, and what's, is there a role of government here? Because we, Biofin works with a lot of governments. I mean, what can Biofin do? What can governments do? How do we create scale and, and merge that, 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 that gap, perhaps? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> a plethora of microphones here. So, um, I, I think that's, a, that's a, a really exciting opportunity, actually. I think the... The role of government in um, taking things from exciting to boring is absolutely crucial. It's not going to happen without them, for sure. Uh, and I, I salute you, Laura, for your initiatives in, in what is actually an extremely exciting and concrete pathway that you've mapped out of uh, things that are happening in Mexico. And I think if we can um, make the initiatives that you're talking about um, replicate around the world such that they're not perhaps boring is a pejorative term, they're just normal. They're just what everybody does all the time because that's just what you have to do in order for the world to survive and for people to make money. You can't do it in the old way anymore. You've converted what has previously become innovative and exciting and motivational into normal. And that's a, that would be a fantastic achievement. Governments can make this happen. They, they have an incredibly important role to play in two main areas, I think. The first area is obviously policy. There's a great deal of enabling policy that is required in many countries. Mexico is an excellent example where the enabling policy is already really good. There are lots of countries where it's really bad, where you cannot um, have ownership over natural resources such that you can construct a, a company around managing those resources for, for greater good. Uh, that's a huge problem in much of Africa, for instance. Um, the uh, policies to do with fiscal uh, um, uh, adaptation to motivate people to um, get tax breaks by uh, putting investments into, into nature. That's an obvious uh, second uh, opportunity. 
Um, the, there's a lot of constructive, positive stuff to be done also in supporting the entrepreneurs, um, hedging them around with uh, technical advisory facilities and connections to um, business planning uh, processes, uh, expertise, uh, providing them with concessional finance um, uh, in order to reduce risk um, and make them able to access the commercial loans that will enable the, the, the work they do to be scaled up. That's something that really only government can initiate and make happen. Not just domestic governments, but also government, the government relationships, so bilateral aid and relationships with uh, international financial institutions initiated by governments that want to take these kinds of pathways. That kind of um, effort is going to be crucial in, in the near future. So, thank you. And Eric, um, so India has this corporate social responsibility requirement, so that a lot of that's donation, you know, but you, you see a lot of companies here that are engaged in nature. There's the Inter India Business and Biodiversity Initiative and others. Are there, is, is something special about the country? Um, are there great opportunities here? Is there a greater need? How can companies, uh, why are companies engaging? Is it, is it part of their business model or is it just donations and because they're, they're, they're good people? What are the opportunities for financing nature from a sort of company perspective in your mind? Uh, thank you. That's, that's getting into a very broad thing that happens in India. Uh, conservation is part of India's ethic. It, it's always been around. It, it's a very, very powerful force. And, and perhaps uh, we, as conservation people, uh, haven't really uh, attracted enough uh, corporates into this being that this is part of our ethic. And I think that's a very, very important thing. But what actually happens on the ground is, does it image the corporate? And this is what I found very, very important. If it's a win-win situation for them where they see this as a powerful branding uh, aspect, they bite. Uh, it's, as I said, how do you trigger this? And if you trigger this well, more and more corporates are going to come on this uh, so-called bandwagon. But I think uh, a very strong motive is the fact that it's part of our India's uh, thinking on wildlife and conservation, which has always been there. And so biodiversity as a part of this. Many times what's happening now is, uh, and I've brought this up several times, that when corporates are asked to fund this through their CSR, they say, well, the word biodiversity is not included. But you say it, that you have to do work for, for uh, fauna and flora. But they say, no, we want this word biodiversity linked to our uh, CSR activity. So there are many things that happen like this, and these are these things that we now need to approach through the National Biodiversity Authority, which actually works at this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, um, uh, so many questions here. Um, you know, I, I see, um, we, we all know that, you know, Andrew was saying before how uh, difficult the situation looks. We're in our darkest hour. Um, and we know that we're going to be water stressed, and we know that there, you know, and business um, requires water, for example, to survive. Um, so, so many of our medicines come from nature. Um, I've, I think the figure is around 40 percent or something like that. Um, of course, food is highly dependent on natural ecosystems. So businesses and investors, in my mind, have all this uh, need to maintain these systems that provide for their own business success. Um, so to me, that's a huge investment opportunity. Um, why, hasn't, why haven't businesses uh, addressed that? Why, hasn't the, why is it so hard for the financial sector to see you know, huge opportunity here for investing in green infrastructure? Uh, investing in uh, sustainable agricultural systems, sustainable forestry. What is blocking them and how can some of the ideas that, that we're working on here um, help them realize uh, that this is just a great investment opportunity? Is, is there a structural problem in that, that the entire economy is, is only geared towards buying and selling physical products or something? Or I mean, what, what's, what's, what are the opportunities here? Laura, why don't you? So I think this is, this is a new paradigm that we need for business, for government, for everyone. 
it's, it's not easy, but I guess it's not that they don't see the opportunity, it's that maybe they don't know enough about it. Um, because they do see the opportunity. And I think one of the largest, uh, let's say, catalyzers of this opportunity will be the businesses that want to reduce risk. It's not so much because they want to, you know, they have all these ambitions for more return, but actually because nature reduces risk. And I think they, they are already uh, perceiving it very much. Uh, for example, the, the last year, precisely, the chocolate company Mars, they decided to make a $1 billion investment into climate change. And it was precisely all coming from the risk that their industry faces. You know, who loves chocolate here? I, I cannot live without it. And, you know, the best predictions say that we have 40 years of chocolate. The worst say 12 years. I'm very worried. This is life-threatening. So Mars finally, you know, took that into account and made their core business absolutely aligned with the natural risk that they have in, the, in their core business. So I think it's just a matter of long-termism. Uh, we have a, a very, very acute problem of, sh of short-termism in, in private sector. And everyone that is thinking in short-termistic terms, they will you know, liquidate n natural capital. But everyone that is thinking long-term knows that this is an absolute threat to everyone's industries. So they are taking that into account. And something that for me uh, really gives me hope is, as you say, green infrastructure. I believe it's one of the best innovations of our time. Gray infrastructure, the one that we use every, every day, you know, the cement infrastructure, like in Mexico, some of the crimes against humanity have been uh, putting all the rivers into cement tubes. Um, terrible. And, and anyway, but the gray infrastructure is the largest corruption hole in the whole world. It's not just Mexico. Um, and green is infrastructure is in this new wave of hope. It's cheaper, you know, you get to restore your aquifers and, and it's, just, it's just wonderful. And the amount of emissions changes drastically, you know, to being carbon positive. So I'm very hopeful because even in Mexico City that we think we're very behind, we already have eight green infrastructure and water projects in Mexico City. So that is giving me hope. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think the, um, the biggest opportunity that, that seems like it's emerging from the the mass of novelty that's coming out of the uh, natural capital and investment world is the pressure that's being applied by the insurance industry on uh, people who have assets that are threatened by uh, biodiversity or environmentally related risk. And um, the great advantage with insurance companies is they look really long way into the future. They can see impacts of climate change, they can see impacts of uh, reduced supply of chocolate particularly. I wonder if there's an insurance bond for chocolate out there. I should buy some. Um, and they are able to transfer that value, that, that risk they have into the future, into uh, investment through um, simple change in the way that they charge people for policies. And that's an, uh, a revenue stream that you can then use to invest in the management of the, of the assets into the future. And I think... Um, working with insurance companies to find ways to generate revenues that can be invested into nature is a really, really exciting and promising way of, for instance, financing forest restoration because it provides you with such a dramatic um, improvement in the chances of you being able to control flooding. There's an excellent example of Waikiki Beach, possibly amongst the most expensive bit of real estate in the world, is directly threatened by flooding from upstream in the watershed above um, in Oahu, on, um, in Hawaii. Um, and the insurance companies want to be able to invest in restoring the forests up in the watershed because that will reduce the intensity of flooding that risks washing away the property on the, uh, the beachfront. There's a beautiful connection between the two and a beautiful opportunity for investing significant amounts of money in uh, conserving biodiversity up in the watershed because the native biodiversity does a much better job of managing the watershed than what's up there at the moment, which is mostly introduced species. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Come in 
or should I ask another question? Yeah. Okay. Now there's a button gone. There you go. Oh, I think it's on now. No? Well, um, one of the things that I think we need to bring out much more strongly is the understanding of the CBD and the understanding of India's Biodiversity Act at the ground level. It's not just for corporates, it's for everybody. And our Biodiversity Act in India really deals with village level aspects of biodiversity conservation. So you create a local biodiversity management committee that develops a people's biodiversity register, and that helps you to get access and benefit sharing. When corporates see that as an advantage, then of course the whole scenario is going to change. I'm a born optimist. It's going to happen. Okay. Um, let, let me try to uh, read a couple questions from, from the audience. Thank you for, for those of you who have uh, sent your questions in. Um, this we touched on a little bit before. Um, but um, it, it's, it's very specific and pertinent is what can government um, and you know in terms of in the policy space do to to incentivize banks and finance institutions to green their activities uh, what's the role of government to green uh, companies so I have a very cool example um, that Mariana from Mexico's Biofin experienced in the Mexican banking sector. It, it seems so simple, but it's so important. Basically in Mexico, Citibank is represented by Banamex. Uh, so basically Citibank wanted to contribute and cooperate with the natural protected areas in Mexico. And the thing is, uh, they said, you know, we have our databases, so we need to put exactly what zip codes are in the natural protected areas so that when anybody in the bank is looking to give a credit, um, if it's a credit inside a natural protected area, they can have you know, a red flag that that is a natural protected area and that way the bank can cooperate in not giving that credit. Um, but the database from the government of the natural protected areas wasn't by zip codes. It was uh, by degrees, latitude and, you know, so meridians and stuff. So basically the, the, the government's database was done by biologists and experts and in, in natural capital, right? And the, the database from the bank was in zip code. And so basically they, they, you know, they actually translated those zip codes and now the bank has a very practical way of avoiding giving risk to, to those naturally protected areas. So that was an actual collaboration between a public entity that is the Natural Protected Areas Commission and the bank. And it was just some, some simple detail that changes all the outcome. Okay. Um, that was a great example and um, the, the um, I, I want to say for a lot of the, the questions, a lot of the issues we talked about before and the challenges of getting investment to scale, government has a huge role in creating the enabling environment to, um, to encourage uh, companies to take a longer term perspective, to report on, um, on their, their social and environmental impacts, natural capital, and we're going to actually cover that a little bit in our corporate social responsibility set session, which is the next uh, session. So if you're interested in these kind of questions, please, uh, please join us for that. Um, I have a question about uh, banks and uh, funding biodiversity. Uh, are, are the banks, in your experience, and, or let's say it's financial institutions, um, are they interested in biodiversity uh, just a social responsibility like CSR donations? Or, or actually, are they doing it through loans? And if they're doing it through loans, and what are what are some of the risks? Um, is it is it to businesses, individuals? Uh, are there opportunities? Um, what, one one point here is that um, a lot of uh, natural resource investments are relatively low return compared to say a, a, a technology company, which could be interesting for venture capital potential high returns. Sustainable forestry is four, five, six percent annual returns a year. Um, are loans the way to go here? What, what's the opportunity here? Anyone? I think it's very important to underline the fact that there are actually lots of different kinds of banks with different appetite for risk. 
Um, so I work a lot with uh, international financial institutions like the World Bank, which is a bank, but whose uh, mandate in the world is to reduce poverty. So they want to be able to use their investments to reduce poverty. And one of the ma major ways that they can do that is by uh, ensuring that poor people who are disproportionately dependent on natural resources are able to manage those natural resources in a sustainable way. So the bank's interest in that case is to uh, provide the conditions by which people are investing in natural capital in order that the uh, poverty can be reduced. On the other end of the scale, you might have a, uh, a venture capital bank that's really only looking for high returns and uh, dipping in and out very quickly into investments because that's uh, of interest to their um, uh, shareholders. Excuse me. <coughs> There's certainly a, a focus that we can um, make on banks whose uh, uh, interest, uh, whose purpose is at the more socially responsible end. I think Yes Bank's an extremely good example of that here in India. There's lots of other banks of that kind scattered around the world who really want to be able to use their power, the, the capital they have at their disposal for a range of different things, including making money, perhaps at a slight, slightly lower rate than, than uh, the, 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 the upper end banks, but for which we would like to be able to deliver social and environmental benefits. And we can provide those banks with excellent ways for them to do that. I think Credit Suisse has been very much involved in, in conservation finance in the, in the last couple of years. I mean, in the last couple of decades, maybe. Um, but I think uh, Credit Suisse is a very good example. But I think banks, sometimes they do realize nature is wealth. Uh, so they, they can see it as an opportunity. And I also see beyond banks, pension funds are the most patient capital in the world. And pension funds are the ones that are discovering that this, this kingdom of alternative assets is very much uh, composed and dependent upon natural capital. So I, I see a lot of Nordic pension funds, you know, the ones from, from the Netherlands, the ones from Norway, the ones from Sweden, they're very much invested heavily in alternative assets such as forestry. And, and I've seen handsome returns there. It's not only, you know, six to seven percent. I've seen, uh, the thing here, the, the, always the key is the long-termism. If you do loan long-term, you'll see the profits. The profits are there. You know, uh, we've seen what Yes Bank has done. Uh, and uh, the way banks work is once something is working, it snowballs. And, and, and this is going to catch on more and more with larger and larger number of banks coming on the scene. And, and that's exactly how their whole thinking always works. So if something has worked, the other banks will catch on very rapidly. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I, I have a, a couple more questions here um, from the audience. Again, thank you all for, for your questions. Um, this, is, this is with regard to, to banks. Um, and government involvement. The private sector is, uh, is extremely regulated, especially the, the, the banking industry is highly regulated um, in, in many of our countries. Um, we're trying to sort of alter this in a way and get them to invest in what historically perhaps has been perceived as more risky investments. Um, how do you, uh, does anybody have any ideas how do you manage that and avoid um, you know, placing uh, additional risk on banks' balance sheets, and how do you educate the, the regulators? Um, you know, we, we talked about short-term, long-term. I mean, the, you know, I know Unilever has pushed back on the quarterly reporting, and then their investors came back and sued them and say, no, we want quarterly reports. So, I mean, where is it, how do we get this whole mindset to change here? What are the options? Anyone? Well, you know, the largest asset manager in the world right now is BlackRock. And they manage more than six trillion dollars with a T. Um, and, and BlackRock has seen this, you know, BlackRock has seen the light. So basically they, in, in the shareholder letter that Larry Fink, the CEO, wrote this January, he was asking all the companies in his portfolio, which is pretty much all the companies in the world, um, he was asking that every single company must report their social and environmental performance. 
Um, and they are not only doing this lightly in, in that letter. They did it last year in, in a shareholder meeting with Exxon. They were saying, Exxon, you're the only one not reporting emissions. We're going to ask you to report your emissions. We own X percentage of your company. It's not optional. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, controversy because in the impact investing world, they were saying, ha, huh, since when is Larry Fink God? You know, um, to be able to to regulate those kind of things. But when you see the financial sector, you know, the largest assets under management make you God, right? So it's, it's a very top-down approach. It's, it's, a, it's a very carrot and stick way. It's not the ideal, but I guess the, the most leverage right now in the world is not in government, it's actually in, in money, in assets under management and in the private sector. So when you have such a big voice as BlackRock saying this, um, it, it's a game changer. But, but I would challenge um, that question that is saying uh, banks and regulators. I think there's um, a, a disruption is coming to banks and regulators that is way beyond what our minds can comprehend right now, which is the blockchain. And the blockchain is disrupting how banks are making money and it's disrupting governments as well. Because the government's power of creating money is no longer only in the government's hands. So there's, um, there's a very interesting project by Terra Genesis. They are doing carbon farming through the blockchain so that smallholder farmers can be paid for the sequestration of carbon all throughout the world. And there's many more disruptions like that to come. Very exciting. Do you want to add to that? No, those are the two perfect examples I was going to uh, underline. I think the, the really exciting thing is the um, opportunity that things like blockchain offer for completely um, radical changes in the attribution of responsibility and risk. If, if you are a bank who actually does know the extent to which that your assets are exposed to natural capital related risk um, through blockchain, then you absolutely have to do something about it. And the, the tools of the organizations like NCFA that are providing to banks that enable, enable them to understand that is the start of the process whereby banks will really have to be much more assiduous about the price of capital that they're giving to companies that are exposed to natural capital related risks. And that'll be the change of something very big. Great. I'm not going to have to. You know, David, you asked earlier, how do you change mindsets? And I think that's so very relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, because if we need to change mindsets in this large stakeholder group that we need to deal with, then you've got to start this very early. And their conservation, education, public awareness, doing this through schools, college education. I, I think this is really where um, actually all this will work. And it will all tie up as this awareness grows. I think it's already, that sort of a movement has already occurred across the world. In India, it's certainly there. And I think that's where we should push that forward, that agenda of changing mindsets. Yeah. That's, you took the words right out of my mouth. So, I mean, we, we, we've talked about, and I'm going to ask you all the same thing Andrew asked for, like a, a, a Twitter thoughts for optimism. Um, but uh, just concluding, I mean, we, we, see, we see that there's a huge need for investment. There's a huge amount of money. Um, we've got to translate that need into viable products that can be, you know, scaled and get that money flowing. Innovation everywhere across the board. Um, but, but almost more importantly, we need to, to change the hearts of, of the Black Rocks of the world through education, communication, awareness. Um, and and that, that younger generation, they're aware of these things. It's that we're the problem, you know. So... Um, to a certain extent, so so uh, you know, there's there's a lot of great opportunity and movement, and um, I have a lot of optimism about the way that the private sector can 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 make change over a quick quick uh, short period of time, and we really need that. So let me ask you just to, for a short um, tweet of a, of an optimistic conclusion. I, I even wrote it down. So who knows what has been the best bank in human history? The best bank. Anyone? No? Okay. So basically, uh, we need to learn from the best bank in human history, and the best bank is the soil. You know, you plant a seed and you grow a whole tree. Um, so 
Basically, soil is a very complex and interconnected web of life that freely, efficiently, and perfectly works to distribute food and wealth to all of its inhabitants. So let's be more like soil. Thank you. So, <laughs> on a more practical and possibly more personal note, I think, um, I think if, if it were within our power to multiply the number of entrepreneurs like Laura in the world by a million, we would be a lot better off. So, cloning for Laura is my tweet. <laughs> Well, I, I think I've more or less done that by saying what I said earlier. Uh, I, I think it's about conservation, education, public awareness, and this creating a new mindset for just everybody across the world. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much to the panel and the previous panel, and thank you all. And thank you, David. Thank you. Wonderful, interesting, provocative. Let's keep this discussion going. We're going to end our session here, just a moment, our interesting morning session, and give you some information about what's gonna happen at the end of the day, because we won't be together here again until then. So I'm gonna call James forward. He looks after communications for Biofin. He's gonna tell us a little bit about the marketplace. So James. Thanks, Gillian. Uh, Hi everyone, I hope we've still got lots of energy halfway through, nearly halfway through the conference. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about what the fun we're going to have this afternoon. Indeed, we're going to ramp up the fun. So I hope everyone's been, uh, had a look out here in the, um, in the exhibition area where all our uh, biofin countries have um, produced some uh, wonderful posters and uh, displays about finance solutions. So this afternoon, this afternoon we're going to um, hold a session called The Marketplace. Um, it's going to get a little bit crazy, um, but that's what we want. Uh, how it's going to work is your, you, the audience, are going to be driving and controlling this session. Um, we've got focal points from each country and they're going to be standing by their, uh, by their, um, their stands, their, their country stalls and, and posters. We're going to do it in four groups. So we're going to do it in, by region. And you, the audience, are going to be roving through uh, throughout, throughout the, um, the, the marketplace area and, um, and engaging with those focal points and, 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 and discussing whatever you like, hopefully, the, the information on the posters and, and finance solutions. So we're going to do it in four rounds and, and, and read by regions, as I said. So we're going to start with, um, we'll start with uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, then we'll do the rest of Asia and then um, Africa and, and Latin America and the Caribbean. Each group will uh, present simultaneously and it'll go for 20 minutes. So you as the audience need to pick, a, pick one. If you want to deep dive in and, and find out just about uh, Zambia, go and find Bruno and grill him. If you want to find out about uh, several countries uh, in that region, then skirt around and, and, and move around. The focal points, their job is to, to engage you and, 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 and keep you at their, at their stand. So it should be chaotic, but it should be fun and, and, and we can really uh, you know, dig deep into some, into some of the issues. Um, I just wanted to mention also that we'll have uh, Biodiversity International will be there also with some of the research they're presenting. Um, Laura can rest easy because we do have chocolate. Um, I'll give you a hint. A big, uh, big Central Asian country with that's very cold and, and has a lot of goats. You can uh, you can go and, um, and and find the chocolate there. Uh, we'll also follow the the um, marketplace with a special small special event, um, an MOU signing between two of the ministries um, here from Ecuador. Um, so you can stick around for that, and then we'll announce the. Uh, winner of the photo competition. I hope everyone's had a look at the, the photos out in the garden out here. Um, we, and we we'll want to keep you all there and we want to continue the discussions late into the evening if you like um, and we'll do that by offering you uh, drinks and, and some food. So that'll all be happening uh, in this area um, from four o'clock this afternoon. Um, a quick announcement about the exhibition. Someone has taken documents that weren't meant to be taken from Uganda and the Seychelles. Um, so if you've got, filled your bag up with, uh, with publications, can you give them back to the Uganda and Seychelles uh, group, please? Um,
Great, thank you. Or go talk to them and maybe at the end of the marketplace they'll let you take it home in your luggage instead of them take it home in their luggage. So that starts at four o'clock. So you're not going to want to miss that. Four a sequential time periods where different regions will be standing at their stand. They won't necessarily be there at the other time. So you really have to listen. We'll have a microphone in there. Whenever you hear someone get on the microphone, then just pause for a moment hear the region that's going to go to their stands and then follow along. So as James said, it'll be a little chaotic, a bit of chaos, a bit of order, but we'll make sure it's an interesting set of discussions. All right. Actually, we also had someone uh, mention our wall, I think it was you, Laura, mention our wall of uh, finance solutions. If you don't have your country up yet, you still have time to do that. So, uh, And as you hear more and more about all these different topics, they might kind of pique your uh, curiosity to the extent that you'd like to put your country name up and get more information about one of those or more of those solutions. All right, well, that's our morning plenary. We're going now, and I hope our schedule's up. Here you go. Session six is after coffee. We're going to try to keep on time, which means coffee will be shorter than the 30 luxurious minutes that we had hoped to have, but it's been a very interesting discussion. Please pay attention to the schedule. So lunch will start promptly, the sessions after lunch will start promptly, and we'll be together again back here, four o'clock in the marketplace, okay? Thanks again to our morning speakers and moderators and to all of you. We'll see you later. Have a good coffee. Thank you.